So I think although I had this great job, you know, Microsoft is a is an awesome place to work, highly recommend. But in the back of my mind, I always had this urge that I wanted to do something else. I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to build something a little bit more meaningful. And the reality is when you're working for a company as big as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, you know, you're relatively replaceable. Like you could be a really great engineer and there's mm. far better engineers than me there. And you'd see them come in and out of it, right? So you're very replaceable. Your impact is limited and it, it can be hard to have an outsized sort of impact on the world even because at the end of the day, you have to fall in line with whatever the business objectives that have been set by management and someone else. So I think although I had this great job, you know, Microsoft is, a, is an awesome place to work, highly recommend. But in the back of my mind, I always had this urge that I wanted to do something else. I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to build something a little bit more meaningful. Welcome to Show Your Receipts, where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. Receipts are evidence or proof that something has occurred. Our guests are evidence that Black excellence is alive and well. They will be sharing their receipts on how they've been able to accomplish so much in their life. I'm your host, Tony Jackson. Let's get started. Welcome to Show Your Receipts. Well, we believe if you can see it, you can be it. Today's guest is, this is going to be a treat. I'm super excited to hear his story. I'm going to read a little bit of his background. Chris attended Antwerp International School with a focus in international baccalaureate in English, math, economics, business, and biology. He has an associate's degree in science with a business emphasis from Utah Valley State. He has a bachelor's of science in information systems and business intelligence systems from Utah Valley State. He has a degree in business, managerial economics, with a focus in business analytics, economics for managers, and financial accounting from Harvard Business School Online. And he has a master's in computer science from, U from University of Washington. In the past, Chris has worked as a software engineer at Microsoft and enterprise architect at Atunix. Currently, Chris is a board member at ComGrow, CEO of the Zig, and co-founder and chief technical officer at Airponics. He is married and the father of two, and we have him here today. How's it going, brother? Hey, Tony, how's it going? It is going great. I am excited, excited to talk to you. I've, I've been waiting for this for some time, and so I know you've been doing a lot of traveling. You, you're yeah. international. You was in different countries, and so uh, welcome back to the States. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's get right into it. So, Chris, it's been said that Income or money made represents problem solved. Could you please share with me the problem that your companies that you work with, the Zig and uh, what was the other company? They five months. And, and uh, I find Could you share with me what problems do you guys solve on a day to day basis for your customers and clients? Yeah, sure. So the Zig is primarily a software engineering consulting business. So professional services is kind of like the umbrella industry that we fall under. And what we do is we help customers sort of on their digital transformation journey. So if you come to me and you say, hey, I want to migrate to the cloud or I want to build a in-house uh, piece of software that's going to help us operationalize something that we're doing or be more efficient, we come into the picture. So it's really about building bespoke software on behalf mm -hmm. of companies to help them realize some of the benefits of technology uh, and what it can do to help them sort of actually make more money or reduce the cost of what they're already doing. So uh, digital transformation, you'll hear that buzzword in the industry a lot. And really what it talks about is looking for opportunities within your sector, within your company, within your industry, and finding ways to leverage technology to do something better. So that's what we do. And that's what we help our customers achieve uh, at the Zig. <clears throat> and then Iponix was it's kind of an interesting story. So when I was at Microsoft, I actually joined the foodies group, like they have these different affinity networks. You have your black network, Asian network, uh, Latin American network, et cetera, et cetera. And they also had a foodies network. And so I joined the foodies group. And one of the things they did was they allowed us to do, take the day off and just tour all of the cafeterias on campus. And so as I was touring them, we were also able to talk to the chefs and learn about the way they sourced their food, learn about where they grew their food. And one of the things I discovered was that Microsoft had a network of hydroponic farms. And for those of you who aren't familiar with hydroponics, it's just the medium of uh, growing fruits and vegetables, primarily vegetables, 
in water as a medium, right? So instead of planting your veggies in soil, you plant them in water, and then that's where the source of nutrients comes comes from for uh, for the root system. Oh wow! So Microsoft had one of those, had several of those actually on their campus, and that's what they used to supply for fresh vegetables across all of the different cafeterias. And that got me super fascinated in the technology behind it. You know, they made it like it's Microsoft. They made it like sexy and cool because it was all tech enabled, and they were measuring the data and had all these different sensors that was picking up all these readings. And so they were, you know, they made it really nerdy. So I met with the manager who was sort of like overseeing that entire infrastructure and uh, just started to learn about permaculture, aquaculture, aeroponics, aquaponics, all these different things. And it got me thinking, I want to see what I can do to take this technology back home. And so I experimented, actually built one in my own backyard as a prototype just to kind of play with it. And then eventually I decided what if we were able to use this to kind of solve food insecurity in Zambia, because Zambia was going through a drought at the time. So, you know, as I researched and looked at the technology, you know, Iponics was basically born from that. It was the mix of AI or data and intelligence and analytics with the ponics function, whether that's hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. So it was a marriage of those two to kind of bring data plus this sort of precision farming technique together to make a better, a more superior product in how we grow and yeah, how we grow food basically. Awesome. So talk to me about, because here you are, you have this incredible job at Microsoft. You're a software engineer at Microsoft. I mean, that is almost like the pinnacle as a software engineer, but it seemed like you were still thinking, what more could I do? What bigger impact could I have? Talk to me about uh, the juggling between, you know, kind of being a high level professional but also still knowing that long-term you wanted to do something else. Yeah. You know, I think you hear a lot of entrepreneurs say this. They always say, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Right. And I think my entrepreneur journey started a very long time ago. I remember in primary school or, you know, like, which is kind of elementary school, I guess would be the equivalent here. I remember picking walnuts in the playground, we had a walnut tree. And I remember picking walnuts in the playground and getting them in these like plastic bags and then selling them to parents after school. And this was like, you know, this was in Belgium. It wasn't like, it wasn't like we were necessarily, we were doing fine, right? Like, it's not like we needed the money or anything like that, but I just wanted to sell the walnuts. Like I wanted to start a business. And so, you know, I sold walnuts after school and all the parents thought it was super cute and whatever. And they bought my walnuts and then the school put a stop to it. And they were like, Hey, you can't sell school property. And then Uh a couple of weeks later, the principal tried to do the same thing and they all tried to pick like the teachers and everybody tried to pick the wallets and sell them. What? Parents were like, no, this isn't cute anymore. So they stopped buying them. And then, you know, shortly after that, was like, I started selling Pokemon cards. You know, Pokemon cards were hot when I was growing up. I think they still are. I don't know. And I sold like some shiny card to the principal's kid, but at like a very inflated price. And I got called into the principal's office and like <laughs> had to refund him his money. And then I started like a car wash business when I was a kid and I'd like got all the neighborhood kids together. We had like little like car wash mafia. We'd get our buckets and we'd go (laughs) throughout the neighborhood and wash cars and we made um, a decent amount of money. So I think uh, all to say, basically, I think I've always had sort of this like entrepreneurial thing. And so when I got out of college and I got into corporate, I did well at some really good companies, right? So I did well, but it was always hard for me to sort of like climb a corporate ladder. And I think that's because it was counterintuitive to the things that I wanted to do. So I would enter into an organization, I'd be working on a team and the decisions and the things that were being done in the organization didn't make sense to me. And so it was always hard for me to like fall in line and just, you know, bite my lip and do what, do what I was told if it didn't make sense, if it didn't make business sense. Mm. So I think although I had this great job, you know, Microsoft is a, is an awesome place to work highly recommend. But in the back of my mind, I always had this urge that I wanted to do something else. I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to build something a little bit more meaningful. And the reality is when you're working for a company as big as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, you know, you're relatively replaceable. Like you could be a really great engineer and there's Mm. far better engineers than me there. And you'd see them come in and out of it. Right. So you're very replaceable. Your impact is limited. And it it can be hard to have an outsized sort of impact on the world even because at the end of the day, you have to fall in line with whatever the business objectives that have been set by management and someone else. 
And until you get to that tier, you typically don't have much influence. And from what I've heard from people who reached that, even then you still don't have a ton of influence on, on the direction right. of, of the product, the company, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think corporate is great for sort of uh, building discipline in terms of operationally how to run a business, but um, it can be limiting in terms of flexing your own creativity, um, especially if you have entrepreneurial ambitions. Absolutely. So, wow. So you've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. One thing that I noticed of everything that you just said is something that you did not mention, which mm -hmm. was you didn't mention money as a motivator. And so it yeah. seems as though one of your biggest motivations to be an entrepreneur wasn't the bells and whistles because entrepreneurship is sexy now, right? Like everybody wants yeah. to be one and it's every, but it seems like your motivation was more about impact than it was, you know, just about earning income. Talk to me about uh, some of those motivations of becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think, I'm not going to lie. I think uh, having been in the U.S. a long time, I think if not already, I've very much been converted into sort of like the capitalist way of thinking, right? I think, you know, even when I was setting up Iponics, I didn't want it to be a not-for-profit, right? I intentionally went out of my way to say, I'm going to finance this through this other business and make sure that it I'm building a model that's self-sustainable. So mm. when you look at the structure of Iponics, it is a for-profit company. Although we do have an impact component, we still want to make money. Um, however, that being said, I think long-term impact requires sustainable sort of a sustainable business model mm. and very, very, very hard to sustain a not-for-profit in a way that it can scale and grow and have the impact of a private company, right? So yeah, to your point, the, the motivation was trying to solve a problem and not trying to make money, but making money was going to have to be a component of the long-term success of that problem solving. Absolutely. Awesome. So let's dive into that in regards to the problem solving uh, component of what you do. You know, they say an executive is somebody who solves these kind of problems. Talk to me about what the normal day-to-day -day life is for a tech executive like yourself. Yeah, tech executive is such a loaded term. I don't know if uh, if I would refer to myself as that, but my my day to day uh, is a little bit hectic. So the Zig, like the premise of the Zig, is our engineering team is offshore, based in Africa, right? And so the thesis that we were testing out is there's good talent in Africa, and that mm. can be leveraged and used to solve problems in the West, starting with America, because that's you know that's where I am, and that's where our core client base is. And so I think we've been in business almost over four years now. So we're coming into our fifth year and we've proven that out, right? We have taken talent from the continent and we've solved some really tough problems. We've solved some really interesting problems for uh, companies in the West. Um, mm. And we've been able to do that successfully and profitably. So I feel like that, that thesis has been proved out. Um, mm. To your question about what it looks like, a day in the life looks like, I bring that component up because my day is uh, stretches multiple time zones. Mm -hmm. um, so I can start uh, my day, you know, anywhere from like 7 a.m. if the client is on the East Coast to like sometimes 10 if I'm lucky and, you know, I don't have any meetings in the morning. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing is the flexibility. But sometimes my day can start at 7 a.m. I'm talking to clients, understanding their problems or really just kind of getting a pulse check on an existing project that we're running. You know, if you're in tech, you'll understand the term daily stand up. And I think it's bleeding into other industries as well. But we have our daily standups, we'll have our check-ins, we'll have our sort of pulse check on how the project is doing. And then we'll also do some business development. So whether that's looking for new business and talking to the, my counterparts are typically so, sort of the C-suite. So other CEOs or CTOs or CFOs even, and then also like directors of engineering or some sort of like managerial engineering function, right? And so we'll have architect level conversations about what problem are we solving? And commonly, we're talking from a business perspective and actually not from a tech perspective. I find people get that really confused where they think you have to spend the majority of your time talking about code and like, mm. and, and that's really not the problem you're solving, right? It's a tool. But what you're trying to understand is the business problem that your customer is trying to solve for. So that's where most of my conversations will be had is with C-suite level, trying to figure out what problem they're trying to solve and then helping them architect a solution that aligns with uh, both our skill set and then also what's available in the market, whether that's something that we have to build from scratch or something that they can buy off the shelf. Um, Absolutely. 
sorry. Yeah, so I'll do that. I'll sort of spend the day, you know, U.S. business hours talking to customers. That's like number one function. Then, you know, my day ends like six, seven, depending on what the workload looks like. Then I'll do like family time and gym and care of whatever personal things that I have to. Then pivot over to around like 9, 10 p.m. I'll start preparing to meet with the team in Zambia. And we actually have a team in Zambia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. So wow. I'll start preparing to meet with the team in Africa. They're starting to wake up and starting with sort of like the Kenya and yeah. the time zone. And then I'll meet with them, get a pulse check on what they're working on, make sure that we're aligned. If there's any new requirements or any new understanding that I've gained from the customers during the day, I'll try and help sort of manage and hand that over and make sure we're still aligned, attend the daily standups. And then that goes till usually about, I, I try to stop at 3 a.m., but if we're still, you know, solving a problem or there's something that's happening, I'll sometimes go till like four or five a.m. and then start again. Yeah. yeah. So the day is just kind of it just keeps going basically like it's nonstop. Wow. I mean, man, that is amazing. I mean, you talk about, you know, a lot of people throw around the term international business. You know, yeah, they do business all. But I mean, you just truly dis- uh, describe an international business operation. Talk to me about, there's been a lot of conversation lately about work-life balance. Yeah. Talk to me about how do you maintain this, this incredible schedule and, you know, teams in Ghana, teams in Nigeria, teams in Zambia, all across the U S while also still being a husband, being a father, you mentioned going to the gym, being able to take care of yourself personally. How do you juggle these things? Yeah. You know, I think people romanticize, over romanticize entrepreneurship. Like, I don't think, I'm, I don't think work life balance exists. I, th- I, I think it, it's a misservice or a disservice to tell aspiring entrepreneurs or anybody who wants to become an entrepreneur that they're going to have an incredible amount of work life balance because it doesn't exist. Yeah. I think part of the entrepreneurial journey is sacrifice. And then it's just what are you sacrificing at what time? Sometimes I'll go to the gym and I'm sacrificing family time. Sometimes I'm working late and I'm I'm sacrificing gym time and family time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think different weeks have different levels of balance and you kind of move to sort of the rhythm of your business as well. Um, So do do I think like I found work-life balance? No, absolutely not. Like, do I wish I was spending more time sleeping? Do I wish I was spending more time with my family? Like, and you know, yes, like all those things are true. Um, so I think there's not a, there's not a perfect equilibrium. At least I haven't found one. If someone else has, I'd I'd love to hear it, but I haven't found a perfect equilibrium for how to do it. I just think like different weeks, you have to sort of trade off what you want to do. And a lot of it depends on your business, right? Like, especially when you're early on in the business, you may not have a rhythm for it, or you may be trying to grow aggressively, or you may be trying to go after a specific goal. And so that will dictate a lot of what you do and a lot of your time, right? You know, a lot of people think I'm going to become an entrepreneur because I'll be able to manage my time better and I'll have all this free, you know, capacity to do whatever I want. And what you find out is you become more indebted to your clients and Mm -hmm. your team and all these other things that are pulling on your time, whether that's, I need to look at the finances, I need to do more marketing, I need to do more business development, I need to put out a fire for a customer. I need to train and mentor my team. I need to think about growth. I need to think about risk management. I need to think about all these different things that come into play. So I think that the term work-life balance, I just don't think, I think if you're going to become an entrepreneur, it's likely that you're not going to find a lot of work-life balance. You just have to kind of do what works best for you. And, And I'm lucky, you know, I have Erica, my wife, she's, she helps a ton, right? So a lot falls on her to, to help me. And she's an entrepreneur herself. Um, and so you have to figure out what your family balance is going to look like. Um, I don't think there's a silver bullet or a magic bullet to it. Absolutely. Um, and let's piggyback on that because it seems as though what you're saying is what most people don't know is there isn't much work-life balance as an entrepreneur. What are some other things? What are some other misconceptions in your opinion that most people, that some people have about entrepreneurship that you found to not be true? Yeah, I think people think you're going to make money overnight. 
because you have this great idea. And there's some industries that that do that. But I think what you do is you read a lot of stories that over index on outsized success. Mm. And so these are outlier stories that you find in the media and in the news. And then they don't translate in real life when you actually have to kind of like slow walk. You know, it, I, I think I've heard the term, how does it go? 10 years of overnight success. Yeah, it goes basically like overnight success <laughs> of 10 years, right? So you hear the story at the end of the journey. And I certainly don't think I've reached the end of my journey. But I think people also just don't realize how long it takes to reach success. If you're a product business, right? Finding product market fit can take a really, really, really long time. Like it can be three or four years and all you're doing is like selling 10 or 15 of your widgets before it finally hits and you hit this viral moment and it picks up. And so people, I think... <laughs> get this idea that you're going to make a ton of money really quickly as an entrepreneur just because you had an idea and it's really not like that. Right, right. Uh, man, okay. So Chris, you, you've you dived into some, some incredible points in regards to being an entrepreneur. What I want to do is start from the beginning. Sure. To talk about, let's go back to little Chris. You know, let's go back to elementary school or primary school. Let's go back to the beginning. Talk to me about the family you grew up in was was it was entrepreneurship was that kind of a uh, a big talking point? You grew up in an African household, so I know education was big. Talk to us about your your growing up and, and how you became who you are today. Yeah, so interestingly enough, there's no entrepreneurs in my family. I think so. Let me take that back. Typically, what you find in an African household, in particular in Zambia, is you don't have a huge middle class and you don't have and you have high unemployment. So you have a lot of you have a lot of side hustling. You have a lot of people who are doing a lot of small businesses sort of just to stay alive. Right. It's all like subsistence. Right. Like you're mm -hmm. just trying to put food on the table. Um, and though in, in one sense that is entrepreneurial and, you know, um, that's not to be discounted as, as, uh, someone being an entrepreneur. Um, but, I, and so I, I say that just to kind of highlight the fact that like there, there's people doing side hustles and they do it to survive. But do I have in my family, someone who was like, Hey, a great uncle who started this great business of blah, 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 maybe, but not that I know of, um, or mm. not that I'm familiar with. So I was born in Zambia, lived there till I was seven years old. And then we were lucky enough, my dad uh, at the time got a job um, as a trade attache uh, for the Zambian embassy in Brussels. So we moved to Belgium when I was seven years old, and which comes with a, a tremendous amount of privilege, right? So anybody that grows up sort of in that, with that opportunity, when you move to a different country on a mission for your country, you become a diplomat. And there's lots of privilege that comes with, with uh, diplomacy with a foreign mission. So we had all of that growing up, at least for a short period of time. Then my parents kind of got divorced, or not kind of got divorced, they got divorced when I was 12, 13 years old. And so that was like a loss, a moment of loss of all of the privileges that we had before, right? So we went from mm -hmm. incredibly privileged diplomats to basically overnight sort of refugee. And the breakup was wow. Like, yeah, the, the breakup was not, it, it wasn't pretty, right? It was a very ugly divorce, whatever. And so we found ourselves in Belgium. Me, I have three other siblings. So the four of us plus my mom with really no support and no sort of safety net or anything. And wow, everything kind of like ripped away. And so I think that was, I, I highlight that because I think it was a pivotal moment in my life, simply because it was a representation of like having everything or having a lot to having nothing right? And then start from zero. And we ended up actually leaving the school that we were in an international school. We ended up leaving the school that we were in and the church that we were with at the time, they were able to step in and help us. And I was able to attend a different school through sponsorship through church members, which, you know, <clears throat> also came at a time that was extremely pivotal. I think that had a huge influence on me in terms of strangers coming into our life and having an outsized impact on the trajectory of our lives and, and make for the better. Right. So, you know, at the time that I was 12, 13, switched schools, went through sort of like that divorce as a family, really, and whatever the, the tragedy and trauma that comes with that. And then when I was 17, I was able to 
graduate and leave. So you mentioned I went to Antwerp International School in Antwerp, Belgium, and I graduated with the International Baccalaureate, which is similar to kind of like the AP program, but graduated, left Belgium and moved to the States and came to college at Utah Valley University. And originally I wanted to go to BYU. I didn't get in and I was very salty and, and, and you know, bitter or whatever. And ended up staying at UVU, which was actually a really great experience for me. Made a, a lot of my best friends today come from that from that time and my time at UVU. And I think it also just made me hustle harder, right? So mm. left Belgium. It was at a time when our legal status in Belgium was very much sort of up in the air. We didn't we we didn't have a legal status. We were going through mm. the refugee process. So <sighs> me leaving Belgium meant I was abandoning that process and going to the U.S. and starting again all over again, mm. right? So my family now, my mom and my siblings are Belgian citizens now, but I'm not because I mm. left and in that process. And now I'm still Zambian, but going through the American immigration process and trying to figure out and navigate that. So did that, which was a huge reset. And then it also meant I didn't have a safety net. Like if I... If things didn't work out for me in America, I couldn't go back to Belgium, right? Wow. I had no legal status. It was like, if you fail in, in, in the US, you're going back to Zambia. And at this point, I had left Zambia when I was seven years old. Wow. Uh, you know, learned French, like done most of my formative years in, in Europe, and then also come to <sighs> America. My understanding of the Zambia that I left as a seven-year-old oh was insufficient for me to be able to go back and say, I, I can go and, you know, start a life there and live there. Right. Yeah. So that would have been a really, really difficult thing to do, but it also was a very sort of sink or swim moment, right? Like you're going to America, you have to figure it out. You have to survive and, and make it work. So I came to the U S started doing college and then I was able to graduate before I graduated, I was able to get an internship at Goldman Sachs. And so at the end of that internship, I was offered a full-time job. So coming out of college, I actually went straight in, straight and worked at Goldman Sachs in Salt Lake City, uh, wow. which was really awesome. I think that was another sort of pivotal moment because I didn't, I, I really didn't know where I was going to end up, right? Like you're, as an international student, you need a job that's going to sponsor your immigration papers and be willing to pay for that. And it's not a small, it's not a small fee, right? So you can't go work for a small company because they have to be willing to fork over twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of legal fee wow. and processing to say you are worth us hiring, or we could hire an American. And so, you know, you hear people say like, "Hey, all these foreigners are taking our jobs," and the reality is, it's way more expensive to hire a foreigner than it is to hire an American. And so, you have to be, you have to be worth it. Like, you have to be worth the money that they're going to spend on your visa. So I was lucky enough to be able to get my visa sponsorship by Goldman when I got out of college. And, you know, I think for me, that kind of, it was a huge boost in confidence, right? So being able to come into, you know, like the number one investment bank in the world yeah, out of college, out of really a, a, a little known school, right? Like, have you ever heard of Utah Valley University? Probably not, but there's a lot of great students that come out of there being able to sort of like penetrate that investment banking world after having coming out of a, a school that was not known for being a feeder school into those types of those type of uh, companies, I think it gave me a boost of confidence. And I think it was sort of a, a great setup, right? So having that on the resume helped me open doors in other places as well. And it also helped me build a, a, a really good network. Coincidentally, my buddy at Goldman Sachs, uh, so you're when you come in as a new, as a first year analyst, you're assigned a buddy. And this is someone who's going to basically just they're probably like a year or two ahead of you and they're going to coach you through and like show you the ropes of the company and help you just kind of navigate your way through this really large organization. My buddy was Louis Cruz, who is now my business partner and co-founder at the Zig. So oh. fast forward 10 years, the guy that I met as my buddy at Goldman Sachs is now my business partner and well, more than 10 years actually, is now my business partner helping me run this software engineering consulting business. I don't know where to stop. I think I think that kind of brings you up to speed a little bit. Man, you hit on so many things. We got to go back because you hit on so many different things. So first of all, wow, you were basically a refugee. I mean, we're talking post-divorce in Brussels. You guys are just in Brussels 
no citizenship status, so you're yeah. not eligible for, you know, social safety net type of things. Yeah. What what was that experience like from a mental standpoint and how do you feel like it's strengthened you from a from a mental and emotional standpoint right now as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think I, I'm glad you frame it that way. I think entrepreneurship requires fortitude, like a lot of resilience, because it's just basically your number one job is dealing with all the problems, right? Like you rarely get to enjoy the good times. Like there's usually something that follows along that's like, I need to solve this. So fortitude and resilience is like a, a big, big part of what it means to be an entrepreneur, at least for me. And I think watching my mom navigate a foreign country with four kids, right? I was 14. My sister was, no, well, at the time that all of this went down, I was like 12. So my sister was 14. And then I have two younger siblings, one eight years younger, and then another one. And, and then my youngest brother is, how old is he? Like nine, 10 years younger. She had very young kids, plus teenagers, trying to figure out how to how all of us were going to survive in in Belgium. That it, it was not a pleasant experience, right? Like uh, that we for, I think, three or four years lived in a one bedroom apartment, the four of us, right? Mm. So, you know, I slept on a couch. My siblings shared, like, you know, I would do my homework in the toilet. Like it, you just kind of live where you live and make things work the way you can make it work. Um, so very, very unglamorous. But again, going and speaking back to sort of like the fortitude and the resilience, um, it just kind of hardens you. Um, you know, you end up having to sort of just like adjust, right? You end up having to to just like mold yourself to the circumstance and say, okay, uh, this is what it is. And I don't know how long I'm going to be in this period. And it felt like forever, right? It was from the time I was both 13 till I left four, three, four years ago to go to college. And so you can imagine being a 15, 16, 17 year old boy going through adolescence, um, you know, in this one bedroom apartment. And that's a reality for a lot of people, to be honest. Yeah. But, um, you know, going through uh, puberty and adolescence um, and then a, with all of those circumstances and then also in a country that's actually quite well off. Right. So most of my peers and my friends, like um, when I'd go to my friend's house, it was a proper family unit and they had a nice high house with a yard and blah, blah, blah. So like that whole time I could never have friends over. Um, mm. and, you know, I was always the guy that would be the one that would go sleep over, but I couldn't invite my friends to come sleep over. Um, mm. I couldn't invite to come hang out at my place or whatever, um, you know. So I think it, it was a period of time that was marked with like a lot of um, sacrifice um, and a lot of sort of just acceptance of my own circumstance and my reality. And then at the same time, you kind of feel shame for it, you know, whether it's your mom or not uh, and whether you have any control over it or not. It can be a little bit embarrassing that I'm, you know, you're living under these circumstances. And again, whether that feeling is a correct feeling or not is immaterial. It's just as a kid, that's what you're feeling. And so I think when I tie that back to entrepreneurship, when problems come my way, I'm just kind of like, eh, okay, whatever. I've seen worse, right? And I grew up at a time also, you know, I had friends, one of my best friends, a uh, few of my best friends go growing up from Belgium were uh, a couple kids from Rwanda. And they had escaped the genocide and lost their mom all along the way. Wow. We met at church, right? Wow. And so hearing their story, when I compare it to my own existence or the trauma or whatever I was going through at the time, like they had it way worse. They had it way worse. And their story is like, you know, super fascinating. Like they went from Rwanda to Zimbabwe and ended up in an orphanage because they lost their mom. And then their mm -hmm. aunt in Belgium found them in this orphanage in Zimbabwe and was able to adopt them. And then that's how they were able to get out of Zimbabwe to come into Zambia, uh, sorry, to come into uh, Belgium. And then we met at church and blah, blah, blah. And so if you know the details of their story and I make a comparison to like my own up upbringing, I'm like, yeah, you had it way worse. And so, you know, they were able to be resilient and they were able to go through that. And they're all super smart kids. Like all of them have master's degrees, like they're engineers and like, you know, economists or whatever, right? Like super, super smart and successful. And so if they don't make excuses for not being successful, I have no reason to make excuses for not being successful as well. And so I think surrounding yourself with those types of friends was was helpful in kind of building that resilience and, and that fortitude. Um, so yeah, just 
the stuff that comes up in business and entrepreneurship just doesn't even, it, you know, it can be stressful and it can spike your blood pressure, but it doesn't compare to life or death scenario of, you know, of trying to escape Rwanda, for example. So, yeah. You know, that that's amazing that at such a young age, you were able to have that kind of perspective to, to recognize that even though your situation was tough, that even your close friends from Rwanda had an even rougher situation. Um, I wanted to also touch on another thing uh, that you mentioned, um, the confidence that you must have had. So you leave Belgium mm -hmm. knowing that you're, you are basically, you're, you're ending the citizenship process in Belgium. You are banking 100% on you coming to the States and making good. Where did that confidence come from? Because the same play would have been to go to college in Belgium, finish your degree there. You know, maybe you eventually go to the U.S. later, but you took what many would call the risky route and mm -hmm. to put all your chips on the table. What gave you that confidence in yourself to make that decision at such a young age? Yeah, I think it's uh, maybe you're giving me uh, way too much credit. I, it wasn't a, 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 like there weren't choices, right? You... I remember my mom being like, you have to make this work. And, you know, like African parents, they're not going to, they don't sugarcoat anything for you. She was like, straight up, like, this is your last chance. You fail at this, you're going to Zambia and I can't help you. She kept it really, really real. I didn't have the option of college in Belgium because that required legal status in a, whatever. So this was the Hail Mary. Like, I remember going for the interview for the visa to go to the US. And we luckily, like the church we went to, we had friends that were also Americans. And so they kind of helped us navigate the system. And so I remember going to the interview at the embassy to get my visa. And that was another like make or break moment. They could deny the visa. And then I really had no option. Right. Mm. So there was like hurdle after hurdle, like so many things had to align to be right for that to work. And it was a Hail Mary. Going to the U.S. was not a uh, a choice of confidence. Like it wasn't something that I did because I believed in myself. It was something that worked out in our favor, and I was really mm -hmm. lucky that it did. Uh, and then, and then thereafter, it was up to me to just make it work. So I think it, it would be mislabeling the circumstances to say I had any confidence, or you know, like I I had this self belief or whatever that uh, you know I could do these great things. No, it was just like there were no options. Like this, this was it. <laughs> this was it. Like the first step was getting the visa. If the visa worked out, then going to the States and then figuring it out from there on. And that was the only option. There was no degree. Like how I felt about it just did not matter in the situation, whether I felt good, whether I was confident, where, whether I was nervous, like it just didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. It just had to work. That is amazing. You know, I've heard somebody who, somebody who's in the business world talk about how the way that you know someone worked at Goldman Sachs is... They talk about it all the time. You know, it's in their, it's in their bio, it's in their information. However, when I'm doing research on you, I didn't see anything about Goldman Sachs. It was just, and you just kind of flippantly brought it up in your story. Yeah. That's a big deal. Most people would have thought, oh, I'm at Goldman. This is another, I'm set. I don't have to yeah. worry about a job anymore. Like this is the path. You know, many people will cut their right arm off to work for Goldman Sachs. Talk to me about... And obviously you gained your business partner from Goldman Sachs. Talk to me about what you learned from working for a company that has such a such an internationally a positive reputation and, and how it's helped you become the entrepreneur that you are today. Yeah, Goldman taught me a lot, like a lot. If there's one company that I think really understands operations and how to build like the machinery of a business. I think it's Goldman Sachs, right? And I've been at Microsoft, I've been at Russell Investments. And then as a consultant, I've had the opportunity to consult with a lot of Fortune 500 companies as well. So, you know, I get to see behind the curtain for quite a few different companies. And, you know, quite honestly, like a lot of companies operate with quite a bit of dysfunction, right? Nothing, business isn't smooth and perfect. And like, as you're, you know, you're sort of flying the plane as you build it. And that's true of not just new companies it's also true of old companies right like you have to adjust and uh and make changes to your business as it's moving as you generate revenue as you service your clients and i think what goldman did for me was 
it really, really taught me how to operationalize a business. I wasn't there for a very long time and I was there early in my career. So I didn't get to see like senior management or anything like that. But even just being plugged in at a very, very low level, you know, as, as, as a first year analyst, like, you know, that's, it, it's an impressive feat to get into Goldman, but nobody is, nobody on Wall Street is like, ooh, wow, an analyst, right? Like you're, you're like at the bottom of the bottom. And, you know, I was in an operations role at the time. So I was an operations analyst. And I think one of the things that I learned, it was just like the meticulous attention to detail. Like we did not send emails without at least like three or four people looking at that email. You know, mm. it could just be like a quick status update. And we would, you know, I would have to go to my peer, the person sitting next to me and be like, hey, does this look right? And then they'd pull in someone else and we'd send it to someone. We would check the order of the people who were in the two and the CC list, like based on seniority, like, hey, if the managing director is going to be on the email, make sure he's not at the end of the email line. He has to be at the beginning of the email line. Wow. And that, might, that might offend someone, right? Mm. Like, are you going to be, you know, are you as concise as you possibly can be? Is the information you're portraying accurate? Like, are your numbers correct? You know? So there was this just like tremendous amount of care and just, yeah, just a tremendous amount of care to attention to detail and to the small things. So I think it actually helped me with engineering as well, because in engineering, you have to be meticulously detail oriented. You have to solve for edge cases. You have to solve for things that are like the unknown, right? And it was the same way. And you could send an email and get a response back from a VP who's been doing this for 20 years, who has seen everything, knows everything, like understand their business really, really well. Like they don't get to that level without also understanding their business and they could just tear you apart for like the tiniest of things. I remember one time I had to write what they call an incident report at Goldman because I was responsible for a reconciliation function and my number was off by $12 or something like that for a Japanese client. Right. And I had missed off something on the report or whatever. It got escalated all the way to the managing director. And I was like, please just take it out of my paycheck. It's 12 bucks, blah, blah, blah. And and it was just like, there was so much activity over this $12 and then oh, the no. emails that went out and the amount of scrutiny and the level of eyes that looked at this, right? Just taught you like mistakes were not an acceptable part of how they do business. And I think, again, it's really, when I talk to my team, I'm always like, the number shouldn't be wrong. Like the number just needs to be right. It's a like, you know, the way that the numbers present and it's math, like the math has to math. So the numbers need to be right at all times. Like we, it, and it's inexcusable. Like if the number is wrong, I want to have a justification for why the number is wrong. And so you bring that, you carry that degree of attention and that degree of sort of like obsessive scrutiny everywhere you go. And I think it's actually really served me well. So Coincidentally, Goldman is on, it's on my LinkedIn, but it's just another job in the, you know, in the history, but it was like the first one. So you probably just didn't scroll and see it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really good experience. Like I, I learned a lot about operationalizing a business. Um, they just, they've built an incredible machine for what they do. And it's a service business. It's not even a product business, right? But they just have checklists for everything. They have process for everything. They have a really, really good way of training their staff. Like they have this like analyst training program that everybody goes through. They take you through writing classes. They take you through speaking classes. They take you through so many different things. Right. And I think they've really just honed the way they do business into an incredibly impressive machine. That's amazing. And even just listening and communicating to you, it's obvious that you had that balance of the technical side, but also the ability to be able to communicate and the ability to be able to get your point across. Do you feel like some of that was from Goldman or was that just something that you picked up during your time as a business owner and entrepreneur over these last few years? Yeah, I, I think um, it's a mix. I think the capacity to understand business and communicate up, right? Communicate to management. I, I don't, I still don't think I'm, I do this, you know, quite as well as I should. Sometimes I have the tendency to do the tech thing, which is get too technical and over explain a technical point just because I, I like it and I enjoy that space. But I think Goldman valued conciseness um, and they valued like accuracy in their information and they valued like, being timely and being careful with your time. And I think I learned that there's attributes from there. But then 
you look at other places like uh, at Tunix, I worked at Tunix and I worked at Russell Investments and Microsoft, and they value being aware of the unknown, right? So at Microsoft in particular, you really, really, really had to scrutinize the systems that you're building because you're building plan- what they call planet scale systems, right? So if you're rolling out something that's going to be used by millions and millions and millions of people, literally, you need to be super careful. Like you really need to think through. So at Goldman, you had to speed up and get things done quickly. At Microsoft, you had to slow down and really think through everything that you were doing. So I think it's kind of like finding, you know, you pull from both experiences to be able to serve the purpose of whatever you're doing at the time, right? So I have some clients who don't want to hear about the technology. They just want to hear about how it's going to help the business and if it makes sense. And they rely on me as an expert to translate my technical knowledge into a business set of requirements and an interpretation of what it will do for their business. And then I have some clients who are super technical and they want proof that I understand the, the technical nuance. And so I have to go super deep into details with them because that matters to them. They want confidence that I really know what I'm talking about and I can showcase that. And so it, it's always a balancing act, which one you pull from. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so as we wrap up, Chris, I got a few questions I want to ask you. And now what you put on your, put on your mentoring, put on your coaching hat. Sure. As if, let's say you, you were talking to some young person and they were coming uh-huh. in with some questions. They, they see the incredible success you've had, Goldman Sachs, Microsoft, international businessman. And they say, man, that looks great. I would like to be able to follow your footsteps. First off, what one book, if you had to pick one or a couple, what one book would you recommend a young aspiring person who wants to follow your footsteps to read? Um, Entrepreneur Numbers is the one that comes to mind. It's a book written by a, I think he's a CPA, and he does a great job of distilling and demystifying balance sheets, PL statements, and your cash flow statement, and helping you just understand what do you need to look at that makes sense, right? I'm not one of those people who I don't enjoy self help books. Like, I've read some of the Dale Carnegie books and like all that mm-hmm. stuff. Like, I, I don't enjoy that stuff. I know, yeah. you know, I, I'm more likely, like if you look at my desk, like, this, the, you know, this is the book I'm on, right? Threat modeling, security, designing for security, you know, like intelligence driven response, whatever. Like these are the books that are on my desk, security engineering, right? So I have very, very boring, like technical, you know, books. I don't have the library of all the self-help books, but the one that's made the biggest impact in terms of as an entrepreneur and not as a technical leader would be entrepreneur numbers. And that's really just, it's, it just cuts away all of the fluff and it's like, mm. Hey, here are the top five things you need to worry about when you're looking at your balance sheet, your PL, and your cash flow statement, right? Like cash is king and you need to understand where your money's coming in and where it's going out and how to stop the bleeding and what these different numbers and ratios mean. And I think sometimes that's intuitive to some people, but to me, accounting and finance is not the most intuitive thing. And so you mentioned in my bio, all these classes around managerial economics and blah, blah, blah. It's because I didn't know it. Like I just, Mm -hmm. I needed to level up in those spaces. So I took those classes as a function of wanting to be better. So entrepreneur numbers, I would say it is a big one. I'm trying to, let me Google it. I'll tell you what the name of the uh, author is. Yeah, I'm going to be buying that book today, Chris. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. So it's by Spencer Shannon. Okay. It's Entrepreneur Numbers, The Surprisingly Simple Path to Financial Clarity. And yeah, and so he, he basically teaches you how to hold. He doesn't, he's not trying to make you become an accountant. He's just teaching you how to hold your accountant and your bookkeepers accountable. Right? And yeah, he's teaching you how to ask the right questions and how to understand the data that's coming out. And then he's also yeah. teaching you how to discover things that are happening in your business that can only be discovered through the financial statements or ways to engineer your financial statements and your books and like your your chart of accounts in a way that's going to make me- the most sense for your business. And he uses a wide array of examples of if you are this type of service business or if you're a product business or if you're this business, you should be considering 
these different metrics, right? And so I think a lot of people will err on the side of self-help feel-good books and I think ephemeral and non-concrete things. And for me, I err on the side of this is like a hard, the financial books are a hard science that you need to master, that you need to really understand. um, And I think it's valuable. Awesome. Awesome. Next question. What advice would you give to the, if you could go back in time and you were Mm -hmm. talking to the 18 year old Chris, who's on the plane flying from Brussels to Utah. Yeah. He's starting off his life in America. He's starting off his undergrad uh, career and his, uh, you know, his business career after that. What advice would you give to that 18 year old you? Yeah. um, You know, when I was, when I started off in college, my first, I don't know. I, I know a lot of my friends like switch majors. I switch majors a bunch of times. I started off as an entrepreneurship major and I took a, uh, a few classes uh, in entrepreneurship and I was like, this is so intuitive. Like it doesn't, like, I don't know why you would need a class for this. So I switched and I went into something more technical and I did computer science. Um, and then it, I was like, oh, this is too hard. Um, and I talked myself out of it. And then I did information systems, with which, which was kind of like slightly easier, but still technical. And you mentioned I'm getting my master's in, in computer science now. And I wish I'd stuck with it. I wish I had just stuck with the computer science from the beginning because I had a tremendous amount of imposter syndrome and I felt like I didn't know what I was doing and I was going to flunk out and I was, you know, very, very nervous. And so I remember when I was at Microsoft, somehow it came up, our degrees, people were talking about like computer science and the things that they were like, you know, they thought was hard in college. And I was like, oh, I, I don't have a computer science degree. And they're like, what? How are you even here? How are you working? How are you writing code? I don't understand. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And, you know, I was at Microsoft for like four years. So if anything, I should have been managed out of the organization a long time ago if I was unable to do my job, let alone start a a software engineering company. But I think I had the capacity to do it all along, but I didn't have the confidence to do it when I was younger. And so I think for anybody that's sort of pursuing a passion, if you suck at it at the beginning, it's okay. It's actually normal. Just stick with it, especially if you know innately that's something that you want to do. Nobody becomes an expert overnight. So sticking with something you suck at is actually a really, really good way to build that resilience and that skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. Last few questions. First question is, are you open to being a mentor? Are you currently mentoring any young, any young people who are coming behind you? So I've had a few people reach out and ask to mentor, and I don't know that I have the recipe or the formula for what it looks like to be a great mentor. I'm always happy to kind of help and answer questions, but I think the success of that relationship is is actually driven by the mentee, uh, oh. you know, and so to the extent that like I can help someone and, and I can, I can be a, you know, useful resource, I'm happy to do it. There's been a few people who've come in and out and asked me questions and asked for guidance and I, I give it freely, but I don't know if I necessarily label myself as like a mentor or coach or anything like that. I don't have any formal certifications. Absolutely. And our belief here is that you don't need any formal, you know, certificate certifications or anything. It just has to be a person who has the results and who cares. Yeah. You know, and and it may be a text message once a month, you know, or maybe a phone call every three months just to check in. And again, it's driven by the mentee. Yeah. Is that something that you would be open to if somebody reached out to us and said, man, yeah. I want to. OK. All right. Perfect. Yeah, so my, my last question would be, well, kind of two part question. First, where can people find you, find Airponics, find a Zig? How can people get in contact with you and see what you're doing in your company? Yeah. So the easiest place is LinkedIn. I'm always on LinkedIn. I'm always on Twitter. So LinkedIn, just look for my name, Chris Chaleshe. You can always DM me. My DMs are open. And then Twitter at C Chileshe, I'm available on there. And those are the two social media platforms that I use. And then you could always just email me, Chris at the zig.io. That's probably the easiest way to reach me as well. Yeah. Awesome. And would that be the best way for a potential mentee to reach out to you? Yep. Yep. I'm pretty good about keeping my inbox up to date. You know, sometimes it'll take me a few days if I'm traveling, especially, but I try to get back to everybody if I can. LinkedIn is, is, is a is a very good way. I would say LinkedIn is probably the best if you're looking for a mentee, uh, mentee mentor relationship. Awesome, Chris, 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 man, I want to thank you. 
This has been one of my favorite interviews that we've done. Just Thank hearing you. your incredible story. Man, I mean, from where you started, the obstacles that you've overcome, what you're doing right now with the companies that you're building, and also the opportunity that you're providing to the tech community in the continent of Africa, which oftentimes gets overlooked, is amazing. So thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. I believe that this interview is going to impact a lot of our viewers. So thank you so much, brother. Thanks for having me, Tony.